Okay, so we're on Parshish Tzav, on 568 and 569. Um, and we'll do a little bit of a discussion on Pesach, this is our last time to talk until after Pesach. So Parshish Tzav is the second Parsha in the Book of Aikra. And of course, the Book of Aikra is filled with everything to do with the Temple. The first Parsha talked about every type of sacrifice. Right, all the sacrifices that a person could give in the temple, in the portable temple, the Mishkan, in all the different ways. And then this goes on and discusses more about the Kohanim. But oddly enough, it does have um, a sacrifice in here. And the commentators don't want to know why did they, the, the Torah take one of the sacrifices out of the Parsha that deals with all the sacrifices and stick it here. So we're going to get to that um, and to try to understand why. But the parsha here, it begins with an interesting statement. It says, Ve'edaber Hashem Moshe Lemor, right? Hashem says to Moshe, teach the following to the Jewish people. In this case, he says, Tzav es Aaron v'ezbono. Teach Aaron, say to Aaron, or command, really, the word is command, Aaron and his children, and say the following. Zos Torah la'ola. This is the laws of an ola. And, and then it talks all about what this Ola is. And Ola is a sacrifice. Now, as I said before, all everything to do with different types of sacrifices was found in last week's Parsha. Suddenly this one is found in this week's Parsha, and it seems to be out of place. You also have this funny thing, which is, God tells Moshe, command Aaron that he is to offer this sacrifice called the Ola. Now, uh, Rashi explains that what does it mean to say command Aaron? You usually say say to Aaron. It says vayadaber, right? You should say. Here it says tzav, command, as if he doesn't want to do it. That you can only command, you have to command someone if when you ask them they don't do it. So then you finally say, listen, I'm just trying to be nice. The fact is, you have to do whatever I tell you. I'm in charge here, so do it. So why would God use such strong wording? So um, Rashi explains that the word here, when it says command, doesn't mean necessarily that he wouldn't do it otherwise. It means to be zaruz him, which is to in, sort of inspire him to do something right away. Now, normally, you know, if I say to you, you know, uh, let's say, you know, but, uh, clean up your room, right? Clean, clean up your room. So I can mean clean up your room now. I can mean clean up tomorrow. It's a reasonable question. When do you want me to do it? today, tomorrow, the next day doesn't matter. So here, that this this idea is that he's telling our own, and he wants him to do it right away. So he uses the word command in order to tell him, get going. Right? It's, it's in order to inspire him to get going. But Aaron didn't need that. Aaron was known as a person who would do anything that Hashem told him immediately. He, there was no reason for that. So it has to be that there's something specific about the fact that this sacrifice is mentioned in this Parsha rather than the other Parsha. And when God commands him to offer this sacrifice, he has to tell him, you must do it. Right? He is very, very strong. So there's something, there's two things that are tied together. So, so the, the commentaries tell us that what is the, the really significant difference of this sacrifice over most sacrifices. Like, how is this sacrifice different? What differentiates it from a sin offering or a daily offering? What is this Ola? So the Ola is a sacrifice that is totally offered on the altar. In other words, and most mostly other sacrifices, what happen is that you have to, you put it on and some of it is burnt, some of it is given to the Kohen, that he can keep and eat. Some of it is given to the owner, the one who brought it, and he eats it. Sometimes you have, and we'll see when we talk about uh, what's called the the soda, the thank you sacrifice, it's eaten by you and others. You have the Passover offering is eaten by your family, right? So in this case, this sacrifice, the Ola, is totally burnt. Nobody eats it. Right, which is very, very strange. It happens to be what most of us, when we think about a sacrifice, that's what we think of, is this sacrifice, which is you take an animal and you kill it and you put it on a fire and you burn it up. And that's called a sacrifice. But that's really not our idea of sacrifices. That's not the Jewish idea of sacrifices. The Jewish idea of sacrifices is that they take this animal and they raise it, that it has a spiritual ability, but it's still an animal. And, you, and if you eat the animal, you eat it in the temple, you eat it with the right, right uh, kavana, the right, the right thought process, you eat it with the right enthusiasm, with, and you use the energy from it to do good things, then you've accomplished something with that sacrifice. If you just burn it up, it doesn't do anything for you, right? You, so we would think. Now, we, we spoke about once before the fact that 
just like we think that the idea of a sacrifice is normally burnt up totally, even though that's not the case in the Torah, that's because most of the world, the world that we live in, is a world that teaches us that that's what a sacrifice is. When you look in the old Car the Tarzan movies where they would go into the deepest Africa and they would find there would be like this cave inside of a mountain and they would go into this long dark cave and there'd be a big giant room and there'd be like 5,000 natives in there and they'd all be bowing down and then they would take some sacrifice and they'd burn it up, right? Like the, right, some, I, I, this was Hollywood's idea of a primitive religion, right? That, but, but the one idea that they conveyed was that a sacrifice is burnt up. That's what you do with it. You sacrifice it. It's no longer benefits you. It's gone. It's wasted. And um, that is how the non-Jewish world looks at sacrifices today, and it's how it's always been. In fact, the Torah allows a non-Jew to offer a sacrifice in the temple, but it's only this sacrifice they can offer. Because it, it's very hard for a, um, a person raised in another religion other than Torah to be able to conceive that by taking a cow and bringing it to the temple and offering it on the altar and then eating it, that's holy. That doesn't make sense. So they said holy is to not eat it, is to waste it. So therefore, the only sacrifice that non-Jews could give in the Jewish temple was this sacrifice. Aaron, on the other hand, has to be commanded to give this sacrifice because it's the opposite of what he understood. Because why, like you imagine, you go out and you buy a cow. It costs thousands of dollars. You take the cow, you slaughter it kosher, right, in the temple, and then you just burn it up. That's like a waste. And and for that, our own and his and his sons had to be pushed to do this sacrifice because they could not comprehend why somebody would do such a thing. Why would God want us to take a sacrifice and just burn it up? Yeah, I understand you want to give some to the poor. That's a great thing. You want to give some to the Kohanim who, who can't work. They're working in the temple all the time. So that's a good idea. You want the owner, the person who bought it, he should have some so he should get benefit from it. But nobody should benefit. So the Kohanim had a problem with that. So it says that therefore God tells Moshe, make sure they do this because it goes against their understanding, which is the opposite of how the rest of the world looks at it. And that's, that's really the idea there. Now, later on, it tells us about a sacrifice called the, the, carbon, the carbon soda, which is the sacrifice for saying thank you. Toda, soda. Soda is Ashkenaz for toda, to mean thank you in modern Hebrew and in ancient Hebrew. And the idea is that a person who God does a miracle for, then that person has appreciation that they're alive or whatever, and therefore they offer this sacrifice. So there's a number of things to understand about the sacrifice. Firstly, the carbon soda is, is not an elaborate sacrifice, but one of the things about it is it has, I believe, 20 loaves of bread is given with it. You take an animal and they would put it on the altar and it would be shared. This one would not be totally burnt and it would be shared among the Kohanim and the owner. Um, and with it was 20 loaves of bread. Now most sacrifices like th this type of sacrifice could be eaten in two days. You'd start, let's say, in the morning of Monday and you could go all day Monday into Monday night, into Tuesday morning, and until nightfall on Tuesday. That's how most sacrifices like that were eaten. But this sacrifice, the soda sacrifice, saying thank you that God did a miracle for me personally, so I'm giving the sacrifice, that's a sacrifice you have to eat it in one day. Now, you're talking about eating an animal and 20 loaves of bread in one day. Now, okay, it's shared. The Kohanim gets some, this one gets But it's more than a person could eat. It's not, right? A person can't eat five loaves of bread and a, and a, and a cow in one day. So wh what's the idea that God's trying to get at here, that you have to do that? And so the point is, is that why do you do this? You do this because God did a miracle for you. But the examples that Rashi gives, the commentaries give, what, what's an example of a miracle that God would do for you that you'd have to give this sacrifice? It says that you went out in the ocean and you didn't sink. Right? You made it through the ocean. Remember, back then, that was transportation. If you wanted to go from one country to another, they didn't have airplanes. You had to take a, a ship, and it's dangerous on a ship. So that's an example. right? So, it's, but, but that's an example of what? What kind of a miracle does God do for you on a ship? You, let, you stay alive. right? 
right? But it's not like an apparent miracle, like, you know, you're about to sink, and then suddenly a hand comes out of heaven and pulls your ship up in the air, right? That's an apparent miracle. These are hidden miracles. And so this is exactly the point that most of us today, we don't have, we don't have miracles that are apparent, right? When, if God wants to do something for us, and, it, and, and he causes a miracle that we were supposed to die and we're alive. We're supposed to get hurt and we don't get hurt. We were supposed to, you know, make a certain amount of money and he makes us millionaires. Whatever it is that God does a miracle for us, our miracles are hidden. That is to say, you can explain them away. You can say it's not God. You can say it's science. You can say it's luck. You can say, I went to buy a lottery ticket and I won $30 million. Right? If that, that, the, where's God in that? Somebody had to win. I got the ticket and I won. Right? That's what people would say. That's it. And the fact is, the fact that you won is a miracle. God made a miracle, but he hid the miracle so that you're not going to say that he did it. And that's a very important idea because we don't have today miracles that are very apparent. Our miracles can all be explained away. If you want to see it as a miracle, you will. But if you want to explain it away, you can also do that. So therefore, today's miracles are called hidden miracles. Right? And that's the kind of miracle that they say is what a person gives this offering for. So in order for you to eat this animal and all everything that goes with it in one day, you have no choice but to invite other people. I can't eat it all myself, so I'm going to invite 20 of my friends, 50 of my friends to come into the temple with me and eat this food in order that it's because it has to be eaten in one day. So if I'm eating it with other people, I'm sharing with them why I'm doing it. Why am I eating this? Why are we having the sacrifice? Because God saved me. Well, God saved you. How did he do it? Well, it, was, you know, it wasn't apparent. If it was apparent, I don't need you to come here. You would have seen it. But it wasn't apparent. So I have to tell you, it's our way of showing appreciation to God when he does these things for us is offering the sacrifice and sharing the information with others. Right? That others should see it. Um, but it's always hidden miracles. That, that, for instance, that, there's an interesting story that's told about one of the rabbis of our time that somebody went to him and they, they were married for a year and they had a baby girl. That's normal, right? I mean, you know, you know, it wasn't a long time before they had children. They didn't have any difficulty. One year, and they had a child. So they're, they're married three, four months, and she got pregnant. So, so he goes to the rabbi, and he says, I had a baby girl. Should I make a kiddish for her? Like, you know, make a kiddish so people can come and say mazel tov and celebrate. Because nothing special happened. I mean, I had a baby, but it was normal. So the rabbi says, yeah, you should. He says, the reason is, is that if you would, what would you do if it took you 10 years to have this baby, your first baby, if it took you 10 years of trying? He said, of course you'd make a, make a kiddish, you'd make a party, right, to celebrate that God did a miracle for you. So God, here, God did a miracle for you, and he also kept you from seven, eight years of suffering. You had a baby right away, right? Don't think that just because it, you didn't see a miracle happen, that one didn't happen. In this case, God not only saved you to have a child, but he saved you from all the pain of having to go through in order to have a child. You were able to have one very easily. So that is the idea of a Corbin Soto, giving a, the sacrifice where you thank, thank God for things that the world doesn't see as a miracle. But by your doing this, the world will see it as a miracle now. It won't be hidden. In fact, the, the word for a miracle in Hebrew is nes. Nes, it's also the word for flag. One of the words for flag. And the re reason is, is because that's what a ness is. A ness, a miracle, is like a flag. God holds up a flag and says, hey, I'm here, right? Because, uh, you know, you say every day the sun rises, the sun sets. In the winter, it's cold. In the summer, it's hot, right? So you imagine one day, you know, the, something happens, something changes. And nature is not, long, is not followed correctly. Like, it's natural that it'll get, it'll get dark tonight at 7.17. And for some reason, it doesn't get dark till 7.21. It's a miracle. God changed the laws of nature subtly for a few minutes in order to accomplish something. That's a miracle. These hidden miracles that we live with, we need to show our appreciation. So therefore, he, God made the sacrifice such that you needed to invite people to come and eat it with you so that you could share with them what God did for you. Because otherwise they wouldn't know because it's hidden. And that's the idea as to why that sacrifice is offered that, offered that way. Today, this this is done, right, where we say, Birkas HaGomel. We say a special blessing to thank God for saving us. So, for instance, a person, you know, you, a person uh, die, uh, gets sick, right, and they're afraid they're going to die, and they get better that person would go to the synagogue and make this blessing of Hagomel. If it was the days of the temple, they would offer the sacrifice. 
because they got, because they got better. It's a miracle. Right? Lots of times people, you know, you hear it all the time. The doctor says if the bullet had gone another millimeter to the left, he'd be dead. If you had waited another few hours, you'd be dead. All of these are examples of miracles that the doctors just explain away based on statistics. But they're really a miracle. So we celebrate them in such a way. So that's one of the reasons that it says that. That's, one, that's the reason why the sacrifice, the sacrifices are in a different part, portion because they're different than the other sacrifices and, they, and why the iron is commanded. So we really did two different areas, but that's really what it's telling us about. Um, the, as it goes on, it starts describing more of some of the laws of how these various sacrifices are offered and what the idea is for them. Um, the, this carbon soda that I talked about is on 574 and 75, um, but we just, we just discussed it. But it says, like I said, this is the law of the feast peace offering that one will offer to Hashem if he shall offer it for a thanksgiving offering. He shall offer with a feast thanksgiving offering unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of scalded fine flour mixed with oil. With loaves of leavened bread shall he bring his offering with his feast thanksgiving peace offering. So he has to bring right, all of this wafers and bread and food, all of this stuff. So of course it's so much food he has to invite other people to eat with him. And that's how he shares the fact that God gave a miracle to him. Okay, so, um, as I said, uh, most of this is going to continue to go on and talk about the different ideas of the sacrifices. But just to give you a basic overview on it, as we said in the beginning, we explained what a sacrifice is. But one of the important aspects of many of the sacrifices is that a portion of it is given to the Kohen. Right? When you go to the temple with a sacrifice, the Kohen who facilitates it for you, right, who basically is sort of your agent helping you, um, who will slaughter the animal, will cut up the animal, will put him on the altar um, on your behalf. So that Kohen receives a payment. And their payment is they receive a part of the animal. That's their payment. In fact, it says that the Kohanim, they, you know, they, that when they worked in the temple, you didn't work all the time in the temple, but when they were working in the temple, they couldn't have a job, so they had to make a living off what people gave them. And it says that the Kohanim would get so much meat, right? They would eat meat all the time, right? They'd be in the temple, they'd be eating meat like for 24 hours a day, they'd, right? That's what they had to do. That, that they sometimes it says that the meat would be, it would saturate them so much that they would actually have sores sometimes in their body from the fat, from the meat that would come through their skin because it would, it would be just so much. Um, but that was the, the life that they led. But the fact was is that they, it is required that they would receive a portion of the sacrifice because that was their payment because they couldn't work otherwise. And they, their God doesn't say, okay, give the sacrifice and then pay $10 to the Kohen. The Kohen got a piece of it and that's really how it worked. Okay. Um, that's done in all of the sacrifices. Now, the interesting thing is that the coin has entire rituals to do, depending on what sacrifice it is. He has to kill the animal in a certain way. He has to put the blood into a certain type of a container. There's this container. There's another kind of container, depending on the sacrifice. He has to sprinkle the blood in different parts of the altar. Sometimes it's in the front, on the back, on the top, and the, on the corners. Different ways, to, because of the different sacrifices have different purposes. And, and th it's important to note that that it seems like these are such minute details. Like, what's really the difference if they sprinkle some blood on the corner, right, of the corners of the altar, or in the middle of the altar? Like, what's really the difference? The point is, is that that's, we ask this question all the time, which is, why should we sweat the small stuff? Like, why should we really care? Does God really care about the details? Right? You know, we, we see in the Jewish world today, especially this time of year before Pesach, how stringent people are about the details, right? You clean for Pesach like, like you know, like it's arsenic. Like you want, not only you get rid of it, you get rid of every every little bit of it and anywhere that it could be, you get rid of anything that even saw covets, right? It's, it's like crazy how we act, right? It's very, very, very extreme, right? So the people ask then, does God really care that much? I mean, is that really what he wants, that we have to do exactly all of this work and not eat this and not eat that? All right, he says don't eat comets, so don't eat comets. Right? Does it really mean that you've got to clean your car? That you got to clean your office? you got to clean everything? So, 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 the, so the, the, you know, what they're asking is, doesn't God really care about the spirit, the heart? 
He doesn't. Does he really care that we do all these details? So the the answer to that is that they're both yes and no. Yeah, yes, the prophet says explicitly, God, like, uh, by, when it comes to fasting, God says, uh, says, I don't want your pain from fasting. I want your heart. I want you to feel. The fact is, is that the way many people feel is only through pain. Because when we have good lives, we suddenly forget that God plays a role in it. We still think, I'm a self-made man. I did this myself. And therefore, when suffering comes upon us, it offer, often causes us to think of God. That's a fact. Uh, certainly God and us would rather think have it that we think of him when things are good but it often happens that people think of him when things are not so good and things are difficult so sometimes that's the cause of why these things happen in order for us to to stay linked to God and to our relationship with him the the, the really the ideal right of this this whole concept is 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 a very important one in that that God cares about the details in this following way. Imagine you know, Mr. X gets sick, and he goes to the doctor. And the doctor says, "You know, you have you have this kind of a sickness, and we you know we can't really treat it. You know, like so, let's say a bacterial sickness. We can't really treat it. It just has to go through you, and then you'll be fine. You know, take a couple of days. You have a, some type of a flu. It'll go away. Right? It's that's just how it is. So." The guy waits a couple of days, doesn't get better, gets worse. So he goes back to the doctor. He says, "Listen, you know, you told me it would go away. It's not going away. It's getting worse." So the doctor tests him again. He says, "You know what? It's not that. You need it. You know, it's a different type of a sickness. It's not like an influenza. It's it's something that's more uh, bacterial based. So you need you need uh, antibiotics. So I'll give you antibiotics." And he ta- gives him the antibiotics, and he says, "But this is how it works." I'm going to give you 300 milligrams of this drug. You have to take one in the morning, one at night, every day for seven days. If you don't take it for seven days, it won't work because you have to do every single day. If you miss a day, then the levels of the antibiotic in your blood goes down and you can get yourself sick again and you have to start all over again. So what you want to do is stay on this drug constantly until you're finished with it. By then, the, the, the virus that's inside of you or the, or the bacteria that's inside of you will be dead. And, you, and you'll be able to, to get past it. That's what antibiotics do. So I, I'm thinking it's 300 milligrams twice a day, one in the morning, one at night, for it's usually 10 days, right? So that's, that's 600 milligrams a day times 10. That's 6,000 milligrams, right? So I'm, what do I got to wait a week for? Take two a day. I'm a wise, smart guy. I'll just take all of them at once. I'll take them all today, right? I mean, I have to take a certain amount. So I'm taking them all at one time. So will I get better? No, I'll probably get sick to my stomach is what I'll get. I won't get better because the, because the amount you take is, is exact. This is how much based on your weight that you have to take to be able to combat the sickness. And you have to do it every day for a period of seven or 10 days in order so that, you're, so that, that as, this, as this bacteria is attacking you, your body is fighting it off. And then after seven to 10 days, it's gone. It'll be dead, the bacteria, and you'll be able to live without the drug. Now, you've accomplished the goal. But if you take all of the drug in one day, it doesn't work. It's like you want to bake a cake. So it says you can bake this cake at 325 degrees for 20 minutes. You say, well, you know what? Shabbos is in 10 minutes. I don't got no 20 minutes. So I'm going to bake it 10 minutes at 640 degrees. Why not? It's 320 degrees for 20 minutes. So I'll do 640 for 10 minutes. It's the same thing. It's just math. Well, it doesn't work. After about two minutes, your cake will burn. It'll burn on the outside. It'll be moist on the inside. It'll be terrible on the inside. It'll be like dough because you cooked it too high. It's, the world says it's this amount for this long, right? And that's the same thing with the spiritual world. The spiritual world has rules. We, we, because we're physical, have trouble understanding spiritual rules because we think they're arbitrary. But they're not arbitrary. The world was created with these spiritual rules, and the rule and the spiritual rules, just like it is with antibiotics, is you have to do a certain amount at a certain time in a certain way. And if you don't, you didn't do it. So if, if it says you have to have four cups of wine on Pesach, so you have to define one: when's Pesach? Two: what's wine? Three: what is a cup of wine? Like how much do you have to drink? Now, if you don't define those three things, you might not fulfill the mitzvah, even though you drink wine. Like, for instance, maybe it's not Pesach yet. Maybe 
you're, you're like many people, are, are very frustrated by the fact that you can't start your Seder to, Seder to like 8.30, right? Because it's so late at night. It's so late at night, but you start at 8.30, we're not going to finish till 3 in the morning. Now let's start at 5 o'clock. At least we'll finish at 1, 12. It'd be more reasonable. But you're not allowed. You have to start after nightfall. That's so late at night here in Canada. It's one of the sad things about being in the dispersion of, right around the world. It's, it's so late. So people want to say, I want to, I'm, I'm going to start early. Well, that's fine. But if you drink a cup of wine and it's not Passover, then you didn't drink four cups of wine on Passover. You drink it before Passover. It's not Passover. You can't, right? It doesn't count. Yeah. Is there a significance to the four cups? Okay. Yeah, there is quite a bit. We we'll, can touch on it when I finish. Mm -hmm. So the idea is then you have to have it on Passover. It's not Passover. Okay, so then let's say, okay, you wait till Passover. But what's what do you mean I have to have a cup of wine? What if I don't want wine? What if I want grape juice? Do I have to have wine? Do I have to have red wine? Do I have to have white wine? Does it have 2.3% uh, percentage alcohol or 12% alcohol? What's the definition? So the Torah gives us the definition of what is wine. And therefore, you can't drink something that's not wine and say it's wine. It's defined. Then how much? So this says you have to have a certain number of ounces of that wine. Right? And most of us, by the way, drink two to three times more than you need. When it says you have to have four cups, right, all together, right, the four cups are, are like uh, 15, 14, 15 ounces total, mm -hmm. all of them together, Maybe even considerably less. When most of us will have, have 12 ounce cups, right, that's, that's 48 ounces. And that's crazy. That's unnecessary. But you really only need like 3.3 ounces for a cup. Right? Most of us drink twice or three times that. So that defines what it is. Right? The Torah defines it. The reason it defines it is if you don't follow the definition, you didn't do it. So if I, if I tell you you have to take antibiotics two a day for ten days and you take twenty in one day, you didn't do it. It won't work. You're not going to get better. You might get, you'll certainly get diarrhea and get sick from taking all of them in one day. But at the end of the period, you didn't get rid of the sickness because you didn't do it. You put a cake in for twice the heat at half the time, it's not going to make the cake twice as fast. It's going to ruin it. Because these are rules of how the world works. And the spiritual world has rules too. And those, so those rules are, this is where you put the blood for this type of sacrifice. This is what you do here. And when God created the world, he created the world needing these things to happen. Just like, you know, you need to cut your grass, you need to put the blood here and here and here. And if you don't, then the world goes off kilter. It doesn't work correctly. So therefore, we see the, the necessity of doing all of these details are very, very important. When it comes to sweating the details, those are the basis of Jew, Jewish life. The details are really what makes it work, because without it, it things, things don't run well. And most of us, uh, when we're raised, we're raised with the idea that, you know, we have a Seder. We have four cups of wine. We do this mitzvah, that mitzvah. But we define what it is. We define, you see it all the time, what is the definition, people, def you know, they define a rabbi. What's a rabbi? Right? They define kosher. Right? Well, what's kosher? You say, well, kosher. You know, I'm, I'm not orthodox, so I, I define kosher different. But you can't just change definitions. You can't say, well, you know what? In our belief, you can eat pig. So pig is kosher. Well, it's not kosher. Yeah, your belief, you can eat it. What am I supposed to do, argue with your belief? But you can't change the words. You can't tell me that anybody who says they're a rabbi is a rabbi. You have to have credentials. You have to do something. You have to have knowledge. You have to be responsible. You have to be endorsed. If you don't have all of that stuff, then you're not a rabbi. You can call yourself one, but it's like, it's just that we don't have a college like the doctors do that can put you in jail for doing it. Right? But, but the fact is, you can't. These terms have meaning. And, and therefore, the details of the mitzvahs are extremely important. They're the difference between doing the mitzvah and not doing it. So when they say to you, okay, it's time to eat the matzah, and you have to eat three quarters of a matzah to fulfill the mitzvah of matzah, and you say, well, in my house, when we were growing up, we just had a taste. Well, that's fine. It's very good that you had a taste, and it's better than not having a taste. But you didn't fulfill the mitzvah in its pure sense, because the Torah defines how much is eating. Eating less than that is not eating. Eating more than that is overeating. This is how much is eating. So that's how it works, and that's what happens here as well. It's a, and it's an important concept, especially during Pesach, right, where you don't have to overdo it. But on the other hand, you do have minimum requirements, and you have to follow them. You can't celebrate at Pesach on Arab Pesach on the day before. All right, it doesn't work. You can't drink two of your cups of wine when it's still daytime. You have to wait till nighttime.
that's part of it. The fact that nighttime starts so late here, right? Especially now that they've changed. You know, it used to be every couple of years, uh, Pesach would fall out after the time change. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, Pesach would fall before the time change. So it was fine. You know, after the time change is harder, but at least it was before. Now, because they've they've changed the whole idea now because they want to save money, so they've done the time change at a point where we will always have Passover will always be after the time change. So you won't be starting your seders till close to nine o'clock at night, because of that. That's really late, right? It's difficult to do such a thing. That's the effect of our being in Golis, our being outside of Israel, being in uh, no longer having a Jewish homeland in the Torah sense where everything's run by the Torah and where we would all go back there. That's that's not where we are today. To, right? it's, a, it's a very different reality today. Because we're living in Canada, where we're higher up in the north, and however else it works, we can't start our seders too much later. Now, that's not the way I believe that God intended it, but that's the way that we caused it. And that's why we have that. And it's like that with everything. So when we talk about sacrifices, about where you sprinkle the blood and how you sprinkle the blood and who eats this and who eats that and how you eat it, those are those are all as important as the blueprints for a house. You can't say, well, you know, he says I got to put in a couple of pillars here to hold up the roof. I don't like pillars. I'm not going to put them in. So the roof will fall. You can do it, but the roof will fall. It won't work. It's the same idea. There is an example that say that people complain so much about details that if I send an email to you and I forgot to put that com, that you're never going to get the email and right. it's just a dot. Right. Just a little tiny thing and I never get it. Exactly. So there's the details are very, very important. And that's really a lot of what the Parsha says. Now, just to go into another area that we're going to be... Um, uh, dealing with is uh, is that this Shabbos is called Shabbos HaGadol, is the big Shabbos or the great Shabbos, and be, and on Shabbos HaGadol there are things that happen. Right, it's the Shabbos before Pesach always, and you know that many places will have weekends together um, because you're going through so much work at home. So like we have meals here for people who want to come to the meals. That way you don't have to worry about having hummus in your house right before Pesach. You can eat here. And then, you know, you'll deal with it otherwise, but you can eat your meals here on Shabbos, which is just two days before Passover starts this year. Um, but for Shabbos at Godol itself, in the traditional sense, was a, was a Shabbos where the <coughs> rabbi would, would, would be uh, asked to inspire the community by teaching them something new for Passover. So it became a tradition that they, it wasn't as much inspiration as it was knowledge, and the rabbis would give a class that spoke about some interesting concept to do with Passover so that people would come and listen to it. And that's what we do that has been going on for, for over a thousand years in every synagogue on this Shabbos in the afternoon, and usually an hour before the mincha, the afternoon service. In our case, I believe we're doing it at six. Um, and we do it, right, not for an hour, but about, and when I give such a talk. Now, the talk uh, is, is often turned to being legal, right, but in our case, because I know my community, I try to do quite a bit of inspirational, because we spend, uh, I don't know how long, three weeks, four weeks getting ready for Pesach in our houses, cleaning every room, cleaning the garage, cleaning the basement, cleaning rooms you never haven't been in, taking, you know, checking the pockets of clothes that you haven't worn since last year before Pesach. Right, all kinds of things we do just to make sure everything is ready for Pesach. But what we forget very often is to ready ourselves for Pesach. I need to be ready for Pesach. I need to, under, you know, to be inspired, to be thinking about it. Otherwise, as is too often the case, I walk into into the seder and I'm so tired from all the things I've done. I don't have, I don't accomplish anything in the seder. Nothing good comes of it. But instead, I should prepare myself, spend some time working on myself in order to be ready for when Passover starts. I'm, I can be prepared myself. So Shabbos HaGadol is how we do that. By your coming to the Shabbos HaGadol talk, I deal both with some legal areas and some inspirational areas so that two days later you'll be more ready for Passover. I mean, that's really what it is now. Why do they call it Shabbos HaGadol, the great Shabbos? So there's a number of reasons brought. The most, I think, accepted and probably commonly understood one is that it was on this Shabbos that the Jews were told by God that they're supposed to take a lamb and tie it to their bed and then um, and then slaughter it and take the blood and put it on the door of your house. 
And of course, this was an act of amazing heroism. Because you, you imagine the following. Here you have these Jews who have been slaves for generations. Anybody who's alive then, who's, offering a, who's, who's taking this sheep and bringing it into their house, right, were born slaves. They were born as slaves. They lived their whole life as slaves. They didn't, they didn't like become slaves. They don't know what it's like to not be slaves. And here they have to go and do something which is rebelling against their master. The Egyptians are their masters, and their god was represented by the lamb, by the sheep. It was a symbol of it. And therefore, when we take that sheep and we tie him up and we slaughter him and we tell him that's what we're doing, we're going to our masters, right, the slave owners, and we're telling them that we're taking your god and we're destroying your god. I, I, they, that's certainly not a way for them to be happy with you. They, they should be upset with you. And for a Jew who has been a slave his whole life to go and say, I'm going to stand up to my master and I'm going to slaughter his God because he's not right. It is not a God. That takes a lot, a lot of heroism inside in each person because they got to be prepared to stand up and fight for what they believe. And that idea, according to many, is why this is called the Great Shabbos. Because the more you put into something, the more you get out of it. And the Jews put an enormous amount of heroism into being able to get to this Shabbos because of what they were taught. So that's one of the most commonly believed reasons that it's called that. But interestingly enough, there's a, another reason I came across which I find very, uh, very interesting. And that is, it says that, um, that there's a, in the Talmud, it tells us, that if all the Jews would keep two Shabbos in a row, they keep Shabbos two weeks in a row, the Messiah will come. Now we will, the world will call, of the world to come will happen. Right when that happens, the Jews have to keep two Shabbos in a row. Now, of course, this is not speaking to all Jews. It would be great if all Jews kept two Shabbos in a row, but most Jews who don't keep Shabbos are excused, really, because they don't know better. They don't understand what they're not doing. They maybe even believe that they don't have to. Whatever the reason is, that lots of them, they don't really count when it comes to saying everybody has to keep Shabbos. Well, they're excused because they don't understand what we're talking about. They're Jewish, and they know, they know there's such a thing as Shabbos, but they don't necessarily understand it. Um, and therefore, they're not held accountable for it. So God is basically speaking to the religious community, and he says, if you keep two Shabbos in a row, the Messiah will come. On the one hand, that tells us an important thing, which means, which is that we're not doing a very good job. Because here we are as observant Jews who claim we keep Shabbos, and yet we don't. We must not be doing it fully because... It says if you do it two weeks in a row, the Messiah will come. Well, clearly you think we have done it two weeks in a row, but I guess we haven't. But an important point is what is that one of the commentaries, or a number of them tell us, what, what does it mean when it says if you keep two Shabbos in a row, the Messiah will come? What, and Ari says it's, it's telling us it has to be two specific Shabbos, according to this opinion. And those are the two Shabbos that fall in the month of Nisan. Because you have the one of Passover, which is the, right, the 15th. Right? You have the Shabbos just before Passover, which is the one we're about to enter, Shabbos HaGadol, and there's one before that. So really, before Passover, there's two Shabbos. Right? So when it says, if, if all the Jews keep two Shabbos, you'll be redeemed, the Messiah will come. We understand that back in Egypt, the Jews had two Shabbos from the beginning of Nisan right, until they were taken out of Egypt. And they were and they were told, taken out of Egypt because they did what they were supposed to do. They kept the two Shabbases. If they had not kept the two Shabbases, it may not have happened. We have the same thing. Just like Egypt was the redemption, the Jews were taken out of slavery into freedom, so too are we. We're taken out of slavery into freedom right, with the coming of the Messiah. So therefore, it means that, in or, uh, according to this opinion, the observant community has to keep two Shabbos in a row, of which one is this week's and one was last week's. Those were the two. According to most opinions, it's any two in a row. But this one says these two. Why, why these two? Because it says that, that, the, that, that whatever happens during a week, the energy, the spiritual energy that you get for that comes from the Shabbos that you just finished. So if we have a Shabbos that's on Saturday, right now Saturday night is over, and um, now from that Saturday night until the next Friday, the spiritual push that I have has been rejuvenated by the fact of that last Shabbos. So if that last Shabbos I was sleeping the whole day, then there'll be very little effect on me as to what happens. But if I use that Shabbos as the best of my ability to become more spiritual and to help people and do good things on that Shabbos, so then I receive in response a greater response from God of, of doing things in the correct manner. Yeah? I, I, I 
this is the point that you said all the observant Jews are, are supposed to be doing this, right? But they would anyway, wouldn't they? Well, the point is, is that if they are all doing it correctly, oh, the Messiah yeah. would be here. Oh. The fact that he's not here means that we're doing something wrong. Okay. Right? And now, understand, I'm not saying that non-observant Jews don't count. They count. They're not accountable. That is to say, if I would, you know, it's not like this in the, in the civil law, though. It, but it makes sense if it was. If let's say I would make, uh, I'm running the government in Canada, and I make a rule: anybody who makes over $150,000 a year has to spend, has to pay an extra tax of $100 on top of all the other taxes. That $100 goes to pay for poor kids to go swimming. Okay, so right, but they, but it's not publicized. Then you file your taxes, and you don't put it in there. The extra hundred dollars, so they come to you and they say you have to pay the hundred dollars and you you get a penalty. So you say, why, why should I get a penalty? I didn't even know there was a rule. Nobody knew there was a rule. You didn't publicize it, so they would reasonably they should say, okay, you got to pay the hundred dollars, but there'll be no penalty because there was no malicious intent on your part to not pay your taxes. You just didn't know, and your lack of knowledge is reasonable. So therefore, we won't penalize you, right? We we will make you pay the hundred dollars, right? But we won't make it, we won't penalize you. It's the same thing with Jews who don't understand Shabbos. A Jew who doesn't understand Shabbos doesn't understand what they have to do, what they don't have to do, how important it is, what it means to keep Shabbos. So how can you hold them accountable if they don't even know what it means? Maybe they don't. This person might not even know he's Jewish. He might think that on Shabbos you're allowed to drive. He may think a million things, right? And therefore, in the eyes of God, that person is is a is a, is they count. They're important, but in the area of of fulfilling certain mitzvahs, they're 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 excused. Right? So when it says then that if all Jews keep two Shabbos in a row, it can only be talking to the Jews who are not excused. That's the observant Jews, which means that the observant Jews right, who, who say that they keep Shabbos are messing it up. Something's wrong. It's because otherwise the Mashiach would have been here already. The fact that it didn't happen means that we're not keeping Shabbos to the extent that we should be. Something's missing from that. I have, I have a theory, but that's not for today, as to what that is. But the point is, is that those two Shabbos that it says that you'll be redeemed are the two before Pesach, and the and the significant one is this Shabbos that we're about to enter, because it's the one that takes one Shabbos and makes it into two, so it fulfills the prophecy. And therefore it's called the Great Shabbos, because it is the Great Shabbos that we keep that will cause the Mashiach to come, and it says just like the, the we were redeemed from Egypt in Nisan, so too we'll be redeemed from this dispersion in Nisan, the month of Nisan, where we are. So just like God came on Passover and took us out of Egypt, chances are God would come on Passover and take us out of the world. And so therefore, we would say the Shabbos before Pesach is the great Shabbos for that reason. But in actual terms, for all of us, it means that you should come to shul in the afternoon on Shabbos, men and women, and we have babysitting for the kids, that you should come in order so that you can participate and hear this class to inspire us and to learn before we get to Shabbos. Especially, in my opinion, especially women. Because women have so much they have to do, so much work to get ready for, for Pesach, that, 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 they, that they sadly will sometimes lose sight of the forest for the trees. They'll be cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, and then it'll come the Passover Seder and they'll fall asleep at Kiddush because they're so exhausted from all the work. They've lost, they've lost the meaning. Is why am I doing all this? Why am I cleaning my house for Pesach? Why am I, you know, making all of this food for Pesach? What's the purpose of it? And we forget that purpose because we get caught up in the details. The details, details are important, but we forget the big picture. Mm -hmm. And the, and therefore, Shabbos HaGadol, especially the drusha of Shabbos HaGadol, is an occasion where a person can now remember why I'm doing this. Now, that's my job, is to convey that information so that when you get to the Passover Seder, you'll be inspired. Yeah, you'll be tired. Yes, you'll be overworked. You'll be, you won't have gotten enough sleep. You won't have been able to do your normal stuff. You'll have been working on Pesach, but the fact is, you'll be inspired. So that's why it's important for people to go to a Shabbos HaGad Old Russia. Hopefully you come to mine, but if you don't, you go to one of them. Every rabbi does them, and some at different times, but they, but they do them, and that's the idea behind it. Um, let's see. What else do we have here on these sacrifices to tell you about? Well, I'll tell you first, because you asked about the four cups of wine. The four cups of wine, according to the, to the description in the Agada, 
Each one is symbolic of another word that God used when he wanted to take the Jews out of Egypt. He uses four words of freedom. I will take you out. I will gather you together. Right? These, are all, these words are that God is going to do a miracle to take the Jews out of slavery into freedom. So he uses four different words. Symbolic of that, we have four glasses of wine reminding us of each word. We also have a questionable fifth glass of wine. We call it the cup of Eliyahu, of Elijah, which we don't drink, but we pour. And that's because there's actually a fifth word, which is I will bring you into the land where God brings us to the land of Israel. It's questionable if that's one of the words of 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 redemption or not. If it is, we have the fifth cup. If it's not, then we didn't drink it. Right? That's how it works. But that's the basic understanding of the four cups. Each one reminds us of that. And the drink wine is a symbol of joy. And when God took us out of Egypt and he freed us, it's a happy occasion. So each time we drink, we drink a glass of wine for that reason. But the, remember, the definition of a glass of wine is not all that big. So that's one of the things, uh, reasons that we do it. But there's, but also the one of the areas that's worth mentioning is the matzah itself. Matzah is a very strange symbol in in Passover, because it tells us that Jews, right? Why did Jews Jews ate matzah? Because they were slaves. Slaves, that's what they eat. Slaves eat whatever they're given, right? So the the Egyptians ate bread, but the Jews had to eat matzah. Because it's, it's the bread of poverty. It's the bread for poor people. It's cheap, normally, right, to make it. It's just flour and water. There's no sugar, no, nothing. It's fast. And therefore, if you want a slave to work for you and to just to be sustained, that's what you give them to eat. So the Jews as slaves were eating matzah. So it says, because you were, you know, you were uh, uh, in pain in a strange land, uh, God gave you, uh, uh, you ate matzah, so we're eating matzah today at the Seder. The second thing it says is that when they were leaving Egypt, they made matzah because they were in a hurry. So their matzah is a symbol of freedom, right? So now you have the same matzah, it goes back and forth. Wine is a symbol of freedom, right? It's God took us out. Clearly, that's what wine is. Bitter herbs is a, is, a, is a symbol of slavery, right? That's why we eat it. But matzah is a symbol of both. It's a symbol of slavery and of freedom. It goes back and forth. Matzah jumps around that way. It's a unique idea that matzah does both. And even to make it even worse, and I talk about this in my Shabbos Agoto talk, is that we celebrate Passover as Passover's beginning. Right, but we know that the Jews left Egypt in the morning; they didn't leave at night. So here we are eating matzah on Passover night because the Jews, when they left Egypt, they had they took they made matzah because it was quick and easy to do. They didn't have time to make bread, so they made matzah. So we also right we do, but we're doing it before they did. Right, the Jews left Egypt in the morning. We're eating it at night, the night before. So it doesn't really work. They haven't done it yet. That, so these are all examples of matzah playing dual roles. On the one hand, matzah symbolizes the matzah that they did eat as slaves. It also symbolizes the food that they ate as free people. It's the same matzah. However, for us, we purposely want it to play both sides. We want matzah, sometimes ma matzah reminds us of the sadness, sometimes it reminds us of the joy of freedom. And it goes back and forth. Um, and there are many um, aspects of this that... Um, you know that, that that tie into it, into the importance of the, of the matzah. Um, for instance, slaves ate matzah. Free people don't eat matzah. That we, we just said that, right? The the slave owners didn't eat matzah. Only the Jewish slaves ate matzah. So then, why would God tell us then eat matzah on Passover? Right? God should say eat bread and matzah on Passover. You're free. I want you to celebrate the fact that I freed you from Egypt. So eat bread not eat matzah. It's the opposite. You're telling me, eat the food of, poor, of people who are slaves because I freed you. Well, if you want to thank me for freeing you, act like a free person. Don't act like a slave. How does that thank me? I mean, what, why would he do that? So the, the point is that some people will say, you know what, I might be free, but I'm not really free until I can have what I need to have. Right? This is holding me back. I'm not really free until I can have bread. I have to eat the food of poor people, of slaves. I'm not really free until I can eat regular food. Right? People will come with all kinds of things. I can't, you know, I like Rabbi Breitowitz once told me a story that, that a, a guy, a fundraiser, came to his yeshiva, and this was a very reluctant fundraiser. 
He didn't want to do it. A lot of people don't like raising money, going door to door, or asking people for money. Even if it's not for you, it's for an institution, it's still hard to do, to ask people to give you money. You're always afraid they're going to say no, or they're going to be insult you or something, so it's hard. This guy comes to his yeshiva, and, he says, and they say, okay, you're, what are you here? Oh, yeah, I'm here for two weeks in, in California. We're going to, I'm going to go raise money for my institution in Israel. So day one, he's sitting in the, in the base measure. She's learning Torah. Day two, he's sitting learning Torah. They say, well, what are you doing? You're not, you got to go out there. He says, I can't go out there. I, right? He says, because I see all the guys who raise money, they have these beautiful brown briefcases, leather briefcases. They keep all their stuff, and I don't have one. So he said, what are you, crazy? You have to have a brown briefcase to raise money for your institution? So they said, well, this guy thinks so. So they went and they bought him a brown briefcase. And then he comes up with another excuse. Why? I can't do my job unless I have this, right? I can't be free unless I can eat bread. So God says, no, you're free because I made you free. That's why you're free. You can act like a slave. You can act like a free man. That's up to you. But it's not the bread that makes you free. It's me. I'm making you free. So God told us you have to eat the food of slaves even after he freed us because we should understand that the freedom that we got had no, it wasn't because of X, Y, or Z. It was because God did it. It wasn't because, now, okay, I can feel free now. I can't feel free until I can retire. I can't feel free until I have money in the bank. I can't feel free until I'm married. I can't feel free until I'm not married. Who knows, right? The Torah says, no, you're free when God makes you free. Right? On the other hand, we have to keep in mind that we don't, we have to use freedom. Right? You know, there used to be an expression that some of my acquaintances used to say back in the 60s, although I was quite young then, they used to say that you that when it came to democracy, it's not enough to be demo, uh, democratic, you have to do democracy. You have to participate. In order for you to be a part of a democratic system, you have to vote. You have to use your power to protest. You have to be able to express yourself. These are all parts of a democratic country. You have to do democracy. It's not enough to be part of a demo, democratic country. You have to do it. And it's the same thing with us. You can't just be free. You have to do freedom. You have to do things, right? We have to act in a way where we, our freedom becomes a part of us. So that we go to the Passover Seder, we should feel like God freed us. We should actually feel that. When we participate in any of the, uh, of the things of Jewish life, we should feel the presence of God and what God did to bring us to this moment. That, that idea right, is the essence of what we stand for, what we believe in. That's why we do all of the things that we do. All of these things of the Passover Seder are there to inspire us to, to feel fresh and new and understanding so that we're free now and we do and we do all of this to remind us that we're free because we forget that we're free we think we're slaves again we're slaves to something else but we're slaves and i can't be free unless i lose 20 pounds and i can't be free unless i can eat what i want i can't be free unless i can get a vacation the fact is you can be free because god says you're free you can do it there's nothing that stops you you can be great right because god made you have the ability to be great you just have to do it nothing will hold you back except yourself Okay. That, and that's the point there. So that's just a bit of an overview on the Parsha and some things on Pesach. We'll, um, we won't be meeting on Pesach, of course, because it's where it happened to be right on the holiday. Although everybody, as always, is welcome to come and participate here, a member or not, um, for our classes, our programs, our services, and whatever. And I want to remind everyone that this week it's Shabbos HaGadol. They should make sure to make a point of going to the synagogue and to hearing the rabbi speak. Of course, you're all welcome to come hear, hear me here, but wherever you go, it's a good thing to do and, uh, and get ready for Pesach because we've been getting our houses and our kitchens and our garages and our cars and our clothes ready. Now we have to get ourselves ready, and it's important that we are inspired and ready so the Shabbos Egoro can help us with that. Okay? So I thank everybody for joining me on a difficult time.